Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Fellow citizens, following the sequence of events, Uganda seems to be at political crossroads. I'm not a servant of anybody. Madam, I know the law. As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation, as he confirms. I'll be always here Saturday from 10 a.m. in the morning. Be there. Don't miss the live discussion on the Alternative Uganda, Digital TV Facebook pages, and the Alternative Uganda YouTube channel. Are you craving for that special meal that will entice your taste buds and leave you with lasting thrilling memories? Look no further. Spice Island Bulenga has got your answer. Nature fresh and delicious juice, the best meals. Don't miss our daily specials from Monday to Sunday. This is Wednesday. Saturday Pizza Bonanza, you buy one and take two. Come dine with us and feel the experience. We are located at Prime Shopping Center in Bulenga, Mitiana Road. For inquiries, call us on 07-04-11-1720. Spice Island, we treat your cravings. Looking for a pair of shoes? Less Up Stores has a wide range of selection for unisex footwear. We have the best quality of all brands at pocket-friendly prices and we make deliveries countrywide. Just plus your order or oh, reach us on 0772-080090. You can also check up at Less Up Stores on all our social media platforms. Less Up, craft your own footprints. Beautiful people, you're welcome to the Snap Talk with your girl Teddy Tanger every Saturday, right from 6 to 7. Snap is not a zero flat time. I have to say, I'm not going to go over to Quata. Wajana body shaming. Speak up. Gain of confronting gay. Overgambe to Chimoka City. Toweda Vida and Tituli and the alternative dig talk. Mukwana Guaguari, a topic she wanted to get the talk. Is it about family? And that is the Tata Wanga Manera who call an overnight in Zwanina Wunji. I there gets a Kona and Yamba Yamba Koyam. There is Nikumoka Yakumu Zako. No Gamma over the Punzala. Is it outside family? Is it society? Oh, could it be relationships? Come and visit, call me. It's my younger, I miss you, bichi, bichi. Especially in game, a better you would have seen. No, 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 Just be commenting a topic in a journey, I got the toggle, I got to joke at the one. The alternative dig talk, who share a nganzi, the snap talk. <laughs> Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. A very good evening, our viewers. We thank you for joining us again this evening. Yes, it's yet another edition of uh, the Hotline Show, and uh, my name is Abdallah Tif Mkasa here in the studios of uh, the Dig Talk TV. Well, it is uh, the 13th day of uh, March 2023. 
So many things have been happening. Uh, it's been two weeks when I'm away, and uh, my colleague Roger has been sitting in for me. And I strongly believe he has been doing a very, very great job to, to see that uh, the Hotline show keeps moving. Well, so many things are happening within the country and, of course, elsewhere uh, in the world. Uh, if we go to Israel, uh, you know, there are demonstrations. Uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of uh, Israel, has come up with very, very unpopular uh, uh, amendments to, to make sure that uh, the judiciary, you know, does not have much powers when it comes to, you know, uh, making, uh, taking decisions, key, key decisions. Uh, that, that means the Supreme Court will be in the hands of uh, the cabinet and more so, of course, the, the Prime Minister of that country. And... Uh, <clears throat> That has, has brought in so much contest from um, a civil society organizations in Israel and uh, of course many other uh, political activists in the country and of uh, demonstrations uh, all over because they believe that uh, that will, will, will undermine the progress of the democracy, you know, the development of democracy and again promote dictatorship uh, within uh, Israel. And, uh, <clears throat> Just here, there are so many things happening. Uh, the issues of homosexuality, they are everywhere. And all Ugandans are equally concerned. No one knows what is next. Uh, government, of course, through the Pen Code Act, <clears throat> there are those provisions that prohibit such acts. But that seems not to be so much enough. And uh, Bujiri Municipality Member of Parliament, Honorable Basalil Asman, has come up with a, a bill to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that they tighten uh, the laws in regards to homosexuality and so, so many things. When you go to parliament, there is NSSF, they're still, you know, grilling those officials when it comes to mismanagement of funds, so many, so many things happening. The declaration of wealth <clears throat> from different government officials. Well, in the studios, I have uh, Major General Mugisha Muntu, uh, the found one of the founders of the Alliance for National uh, Transformation. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are privileged. He is with us here tonight, and we will be discussing quite a number of things in that line. You're most welcome, General. Thank you. Uh, it's been a while. I last saw you in Serere during uh, the <clears throat> the by-elections, and uh, we keep wondering. Uh, the last time I had you here, you said um, you you you. You're so much doing on ground, trying to establish structures, you know, doing this and that to ensure that really uh, ANT becomes very, very strong on ground. But when you look at what happened in Serere by elections, one would ask, why are you establishing these structures? Why didn't these structures uh, uh, push the ANT flag bearer, Honorable Alisa Lasso, back to parliament? Welcome to the show, Honorable. Yes, you're still Honorable. Yeah, Honorable. You once represented us in the once a Honorable is a Honorable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I think uh, we, we can uh, start from, yeah. yes, for, for a while, and we've been seeing these uh, activities uh, across the country in different places, and, but one would still ask, uh, several by elections, maybe one would think this is the most ample time for them to see the structures, uh, the ANTs building across the country, and what is lacking within these structures, what happened in Sadar? <clears throat> issues I think we're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. um, the presence of organizations on the ground is one thing. We keep focused on that. Okay. So, so, <clears throat> medium, long term, objective, because there's no way you can have strength as an organization unless you don't unless you have representation at all levels of society where yeah. society operates from. And the manner in which our society and uh, the political infrastructure is uh, designed and how it operates, it starts from the village, the parish, the sub-county. Actually, that's where there is a concentration 
of interaction between power and the people. And then the top structures ordinarily are supposed to be dependent in a normal situation on the lower structures. Because if you want to serve society, the best form of service <coughs> one would uh, assume the people want. Society needs, yes. What society needs. Mm -hmm. And also one would uh, expect that the best form of uh, service is that you always need to give feedback. So why are you going to give feedback? It is from the very people who have expressed their needs. Mm -hmm. And who are the majority of the people? <coughs> they are that, that level. Yes. So even before you go to the issues of competition for positions. Position and leadership. Like competing for positions of leadership. One would need to understand what model of governance do we want in this country? Our view is that uh, even outside competition or, doing, or elect, besides the electoral processes, that you need to have a presence where the people are. That's our main concern. And that's what we keep building. It's a slow, painstaking process when for, you talk, many, for many different <coughs> factors. General, when you talk of uh, having a basis or building a base where people are, what do you mean? Yes. I mean, where, is, where are the majority of the people? They are the lower level, the village, mm -hmm. in the rural areas. If it is in towns or municipal centers or in cities, it is at uh, the cell or the ward. I think I don't know which is bigger, the ward or the cell. The, 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 the cell is the, the cell. The, 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 the cell, lowest, yes. then the ward, then the division. Those are the roots of an organization. Now, in the rural areas, it is the village, the parish, and the sub county. So, if you don't operate at those levels as an organization, <coughs> how do you get to know the needs of the population? that you want uh, to purport to be wanting to serve. Mm -hmm. Even when you process those views and eventually they are evolved into policy, at the level when you are going to implement policy, where do you give feedback? It has to be down there, the very people where they are. Yes. And there are many channels <coughs> of feedback. In modern ways, I mean, right now we are on TV. You can choose to operate on TV if you are government. Yeah. Or if you're a party, you can choose to operate on social media. You can choose to operate on whatever. The most but boys. the most, the most uh, traditional, and I suspect that it is, is going to be around for a while, because human interaction is the most, I think, effective way of picking what the people desire and the feedback. So how, do you, how do you do that? you must have infrastructure. Because even, if, even when you have leadership at the national <coughs> level, of a party, or if you are in government, right, you cannot go all over 70,000 villages in a short time. You simply can't. Nor can you go around the 11,000 parishes in a very short period of time, if you are a team from headquarters. Nor can you go around the around 2,000 uh, sub-counties. So what's the effective method you use, therefore? You build the infrastructure. Yes. And then build communication systems within the party. Because the leaders, if they are well-trained, well-motivated, and if you have uh, uh, objectives that uh, drive you as an organization and the leadership, then it means that you are best. The leaders are the best, are the first and the best representation for an organization. Therefore, they need to know the issues about the party. And therefore, they pick what the interest of the organization is in the 60-something thousand villages, villages yes. and 11,000 parishes. They send them through the communication networks of the organization up the top level. They are, they are discussed, they are you know, uh, evolved into uh, policy options or decisions that are going to be made. Then you give feedback. That's the most traditional way. It's been there since, uh, you know, society has been evolving. And some can choose to replace that by going on uh, social media and communicating. I don't think we have reached that point when you can be effective as an organization by just operating on social media and radio and TV. And therefore, you must go and build that infrastructure. Now, if you don't do that, where well, you can go in the government, I, I, I'm not so sure that everybody does that. But we prefer to do that. And we're just going to keep trying to do that. 
We have not uh, reached uh, where we desire to be. There are so many challenges, most of them logistical, financial, and some, to a certain extent, the environment within which we operate, to a certain extent, the population itself that has been so burnt over 60 years, they have almost given up on themselves, besides giving up on the country. So you're also having challenges of the mindset of the population. Nevertheless, none of that will deter us. So we'll continue doing all things that are necessary to be done. Having said that, yes, like in, in Serere. Now, even when you have, you have that infrastructure, when you go into the electoral period itself, there are now challenges of a regime which is totally frightened of losing power, that has reached a point where they have literally determined that they must entrench themselves. Not through legal, <coughs> transparent processes, like the one of elections, where you would expect contestation and the people choose, but through using unconventional methods, which they use. I mean, like, we, 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 we could see what was going on. And we weren't shocked. It's not that we didn't expect it. We knew, because we have been seeing the trend since, for by-elections since uh, uh, 2021 elections. We, we saw what happened in uh, Kasese, Busongora North. We saw what happened, I think, Busongora South. We saw what happened in... Uh, Kimbiri. Uh, yeah, Bichimbiri. We saw what happened in uh, Omoro. We saw what happened in Soroti. We saw... Palis, I think. There's uh, one in Palis. Yeah, that one we didn't uh, actually participate closely. I, 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 at least at the personal level, I don't have a lot of details <coughs> in regard to that. We saw what happened in Kayunga. So our going in again was not that we were not aware of the environment in which we were operating. No, it's a totally different consideration. Because in a situation where you have a frightened regime, which has got a leadership that is so paranoid, simultaneously we have got a population which has been so beaten that it has literally lost hope. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, we deserve change. We deserve it, and we must work for it. But you are operating in such an environment. On one side, there is a government which is absolutely reckless and irresponsible. On the other side, you have a population which has almost given up on itself. So do you also sit back and give up? <laughs> Our view is that we have to do everything humanly possible to maintain hope. Even when we know we are going to operate in a very difficult environment. And also keep pushing and pushing and hopefully that there are people even within the institutions, maybe like electoral commission, maybe within government, who reach a point and say, you know what? We are making so many mistakes. The cumulative level of the mistakes you are making may lead to an implosion at some point. And hopefully, if they reach a point where they recognize that, then they could start carrying out corrective actions. That can't happen unless we keep engaged and we keep pushing and not allow ourselves to be frustrated or to give up. So, I mean, like in Serere, 15 polling stations were raided, broad daylight, with the RDCs, the most prominent name that keeps coming up is Owanyi, Owanyi, and, 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 and Ahmed Washaka. With a team of police and, uh, and uh, army, raiding police stations in the, <coughs> I mean, uh, police stations in the open, and simply ticking ballots. Now, I have, I, we, we, we in, initially in the morning, because it started around 11, at that point, the electoral commission came because I went to one of the polling stations. Unfortunately, the chairperson was there with the electoral commission. The returning officer was there, and they tried to look for some intervention. They also came to the second, where I also found them, a second polling station. Now, by the time they, re they did that in the third and the fourth, we started calling phones, nobody was responding. Not electoral commission, not police, not anybody. So there are problems in the whole system. Because when the electoral commission is not able to act, then it makes those who are reckless, who do all those things, recognize that whatever they're going to do is going to succeed. Because if, if the electoral commission, if it wants, if they have the guts and the desire and the courage to do that, the moment there's the by-election of that nature, and any, any force outside the structured and legal processes intervenes, and the electoral commission is firm and cancels that uh, station, 
cancels the second one. Even if it cancels ten, uh, General, I can tell you, people who act recklessly will pull back. Uh, General, what yes. I know, um, there is a polling station called Kiere Primary School. Yes. Uh, when they were computing the final figures, yes, it was not added because of uh, the violence which was there, and that yes. came because there is a, a report which yes. was made there and then. Yes, yes. And results from that polling station. We are not. My maybe it was. May, I don't know. I don't know which that one was because there's also one. That one had where uh, the where the boxes were simply scattered. Yeah, yeah. For for that for, for that particular one, uh, it was raided and there was ballot stuffing. Yeah. So when they were tallying at the particular polling station, yes, voters were more than the the ballots which were issued. Okay. So we there was a team that made some noise about it. Okay. And then they had a direct communication with the EC and those results were not added. But my question here is, yes. uh, you are a general. Yes. And uh, unlike the other political organizations, yes. which are headed by civilians, yes. one would think that the approach of General Mugisha Muntu, yes. when he's dealing, you know, going into an election, uh, there are some levels of expectations yes. from you, which they do not expect from other yes. politicians. Yes. One, You've been part of the, the regime at one particular time. Yes. You were part of the guerrilla team that brought this very government. So yes. you know each and everything, I want to assume, yes. that you know whatever, maybe if they're planning to do this, you have the countermeasures. One would ask, why do you still, up to this point, General Mugisha Muntu, Army Commander, former Army Commander for nine years, is still crying over the same things, an ordinary lead of a party, who even does not know how to operate a gun, I'm not saying you should yes, carry yes, a gun. Yes, yes, yes. You know, he's crying of the same things. Not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I am not crying. <laughs> I am organizing. Yes. Because it's short of using weapons. Because if we had use of weapons and we are all now in the field of uh, military operation, it, it would be, be a totally different question. But we're not using weapons. At least we are not armed. And then you have the side that has got... Uh, uh, control over the state security apparatus, reckless as they are. So what do you do in that, in that instance? You, you, have, you have many options. You could give up. You could decide to try to be violent using whatever means of violence you'd want to use. Or you could say, you know what? We are dealing with a reckless group. We're dealing with a disempowered population. So how do we keep on organizing and building and raising hope to a point where this, because a crisis eventually builds, always, that's inevitable. It doesn't matter who is involved. Yeah. Because there is what they call uh, the law of cumulative effect. You will make mistakes one after another. You may not deal with those mistakes even when people raise them. But when they accumulate and there are no corrective actions, it reaches a point where there will be a turning point. A point they where there is a small, you know, something small. It never, it, it never even actually is something so big that triggers. And it sparks off. Yeah. It triggers spontaneous actions that cause a, a, a shift in the balance of forces. To me, that's why I maintain hope in the things that we do. Because when that shift happens, and, and again, that's where most people seem not to recognize that when that shift happens, nobody, no force on earth can stop it. But you can try to influence it in a particular direction. If you have built the necessary uh, organizational capabilities. Now, it, it, and it can, it can uh, you know, occur in different ways. At times it can rupture. Or there's an implosion, and you can find contestation, which is all, all at times becomes violent. That's why at times you find street actions. At times you find a, a breakdown in the state security apparatus, and you find factional fighting. Different countries have got different conditions. We have seen it happen all over the world. The, 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 no country has got similar conditions. Mm. So it is not something that you can even determine as to how it will unfold in a particular instance. But you can only look at the situation and see a lot of similarities and see how that cumulative, the, the law of cumulative effect is building up. You see the momentum. And most times when it is going to occur, almost everybody has reached a point where they recognize that something's going to happen. They may not know what.
<laughs> but it always happens. Yep. Now, there are many people who simply wait for that to happen. Now, in the meantime, they have <laughs> given up. <laughs> We're not people who give up, because we know that there is a situation that will need to be managed after that confrontation of whatever forces are at play. Whether it is through street violence or insurrection, whether it is through warfare, whether it is through uh, uh, faction of fighting, whatever it is, it always Lead to that leads point. that. And, and at that point, it requires people who are well organized to participate in shaping the direction of the new opportunities that there are in a new direction. Because there's no way a country can change direction unless there are people who are ready to do what? To participate in shaping a new direction. General. Now, when you don't have people who are able to do that, normally you'll get change. You can see changes of faces. The president has left, the cabinet has left, new people are in. But they don't know what to do. But you continue moving in the same direction, doing the same things, <laughs> you know? And, and it completely perturbs me, or maybe uh, confuses me why people are not able to recognize that you have to keep organizing so that there are people who shape a new direction. <laughs> you know? Do these locals understand that there is need? You know, the people you engage, you deal with, yes. do they really understand that there is need for organization in the struggle? The, the, the population on the ground are frustrated. They want to see results <laughs> yesterday. As soon as yesterday. But at the same time, they are conflicted. Because they also need their needs, their human needs, to be met today. The, even when you try to talk to them about the future. They don't want to listen. They, they, they think that's too long. They want immediate. Things. They want immediate. They they the immediate, yes. Long. They, they need uh, maybe lunch or dinner for that <laughs> night, you see? So it creates confusion. And therefore, you cannot uh, wholly depend on them. You must keep building the leaders which organize what the needs of the future are, and who are able to operate in the current em environment, oppressive as it is, but they are resilient, and they keep organizing, they don't lament, they don't give up, because change is a constant. Change happens. Nobody can stop the dynamics of change once they have been sparked into motion. So we, 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 we think different, we act different. And my hope is that there are people who will understand us and as we keep on building, that they will keep on joining us so that we can build a critical mass of leaders who understand the environment we are operating in, but who cannot give up and also know the need of how we should influence the future when a shift happens, because the shift will happen. There are, many more, there are many more people who are focusing on the shift rather than what happens after the shift. Yes. <laughs> you know, what happens after the shift cannot be organized on the night of the shift. It, it has to be built over time. How tough is uh, that process of uh, changing uh, the mindset of Ugandans to, to, to show them the direction you're trying to talk about? If you For instance, yes, yes. A, a party like ANT, you know, at, at our country setting, yes. we only assume that the party is strong yes. when it has representation in parliament. And now here we have ANT trying to come up with a, a different approach yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, to yeah. understanding our if, politics, if, uh, if, providing if, solutions. If, if we go by numbers, then NRM, NRM should be the strongest party. <laughs> but if, they, if, if numbers, because they have got about 300 and something plus members of parliament, they have got uh, more than three quarters of the LOC5 chairpersons. Yeah. They have got uh, more than 70% of the LOC3 chairpersons. They have got more than 60% uh, of the LOC1. LOC Could those be LOC indicators that they very strong? But then why are they frightened? Because strength gives you confidence. So if they are strong, why are they frightened? We don't have the numbers. Frightened well, of? I mean, a a or no, frightened a of a by-election. <laughs> okay. Because for, to, for them to do what they do simply shows you that they are frightened. Anybody who can't decipher that is, is really uh, uh, wasting people's time being in politics. Any leader who doesn't understand that the actions of the NRM in by-election, forget about the general election, is a clear sign of fright. Because if you can't have a free, fair competition over one seat, what does that say? 
What does that exactly say? Because you already have the numbers, it is not as if you think that when a, a, an opposition party takes a seat, I mean, since, since 2021 general elections, we have had how many uh, by-elections? There are not even 10. Around seven, I think. Yep. So it's not as if those numbers are going to change the balance of force in, in parliament, parliament, that they would deny you numbers. So why do they engage in all the, the, the shameful acts? Why do they frighten the electoral commission, frighten the police forces, frighten the army officers who get involved, make them do wrong things? Why? So strength is not in numbers. We don't have any member of parliament yet as a lands for national transformation, but we are strong because we have got the correct message. We have got the convictions. Does the population feel your strength? They will. That's in the future tense. As now. day follows night. When you are fighting on the side of right, always, as long as you are resilient and you don't give up, I can tell you, history has shown, and it's going to show again what that means. ANT <laughs> came up with uh, 3,335 votes. The FDC had 1,252 votes. Yes. The Omodinge Manuel, an independent candidate, NRM leaning, uh, he got 15,638 votes. Yes. Ongurucho Martin, an independent, came with uh, 2,523 votes. Ocho Philip, NRM, 13,206. When you look at the statistics, the, the, the results here, uh, Omoding is NRM, Ocho Philip, NRM, and they have the highest you know, votes. What lessons do these statistics draw <laughs> to the opposition? <laughs> I, 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 I fully understand a situation where the population is conflicted. Because that very population, when you go to them, they, have got, they are full of grievances. <laughs> I mean, go in any area where there is NRM representation, and you see the grievances that people have. You see, having grievances is one thing, but reaching a point of surrender is another. So they have grievances, but they have literally surrendered in many parts of the country. Look at Karamoja. Maybe that would be the best example <coughs> that could clarify what the kind of situation there is in this country. Karamoja has always been <coughs> NRM. Mm. 80 plus. <laughs> Things are changing. But even now, where, I mean, they are, they, the majority of members, I don't know how many, I don't recall how many members of parliament the whole of Karamoja belt has, sub-region, but they must be about 90%. True. Maybe there could be like some, a few independents. Independent and at all. who could also be who are leading, leading to, an to the NRM, yes. But see what is happening. How can you expect, how can you... <laughs> A, a place which is fully represented by a ruling party, and it is in a mess. And the Karmajong have got grievances, but they are also trapped. So I fully understand the psychology of the population. We can't give up. They may give up on themselves. We can't give up. This is our country, because we all have to live within the same country. You know, that's why we, those of us, even now, as we do what we do, incidentally in Alliance for National Transformation. The, the, the immediate thing is attract the men and women, and they don't have to be, they, they actually they can't even be hundreds of thousands. Normally you need a core of people who understand what the medium long term objectives are of an organization, what you intend to do, and people who are equal to the challenges of the times. You build them into the infrastructure that becomes the vehicle for transformation. People shift. Don't bother about the, the state of mind in which the people are. If, if you keep looking on that, you can give up. You can just push, throw in the tower, go and do your own things. If you follow what the population, the situation of the population. You just simply can't follow what the population, the situation they're in. You are trying to salvage them from that situation. And there is also a point when they shift. I have seen these shifts happen all the time. I saw what happened in the north. 
when there was a shift when in an FDC, we had a, a big chunk of West Nile under our control, Achori area under our control, Lango was under UPC, we had Teso, and then even, and, and to a large extent, Buganda. No, Buganda was most DP. times a, uh, a few, a few uh, areas of Buganda were by DP, the majority were NRM. Wester was NRM until we penetrated as FDC when we took Kasese, literally. And then, unfortunately, of course, that's a totally different question. I can't engage in it unless you, you know, we have get time to talk about it. A shift happens. Again, because the population waiting for change and it wasn't happening, and the movement went behind, uh, you know, the organizational capabilities of the opposition and took all those areas where we were dominant. But as that was happening, see, the shift in Uganda was almost sudden. Because Uganda now is under new. So you don't focus on the shift by the population. You focus on building the capability so that when the shift happens, and it always does. It finds you prepared. It finds you prepared. Because as, as they say, success is an outcome of preparation, preparation. meeting with opportunity. Now, there are many people who are waiting for opportunity, but they're not prepared. They're not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, the hot Alice, and in the studios, we have uh, Major General Mugisha Muntu trying to look at uh, a few things as they do happen in uh, our country. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the ANT participated in the Senate by election, and uh, things went as they came up. And um, uh, General is still strong and believes that. Uh, one time, the population will get to understand what they are trying to build and, uh, of course, the goodwill behind all that for this country. Well, uh, we need to get done with this discussion of Serere. Uh, what are the key points we pick out from that by election? And maybe, of course, like it has been in other... To be, to be honest with you, anybody who uh, participated or, or would do analysis for Kayunga, for Omoro, for uh, Soroti, for Songora uh, South, for Serere, is similar, more or less. It's a trend. So the question is, how do we break that trend? Is it possible for us to do all things that are necessary to cause a shift, one, in the thinking of the institutions themselves involved? Because I, I know for sure, for me, if the Electoral Commission had courageous men and women, they can start causing change. That's a key factor in the change process. Two, one hopes that the, the government itself would... <laughs> I can't understand how people can be in a regime and they see us walking us, you know, sleepwalking ourselves into an open crisis at some point, and they just keep mute. I just simply can't understand. But we can't give up. Maybe they don't see what you see. Well, at some point they'll have to see. They will. If they don't see, they can continue churning on as a country, you know, when you're in a train which has no brakes, so the rail running full scale, something will stop it somewhere or it will derail. In the meantime, for us, our main task is to keep organizing. As I've already indicated, our mindset operates from totally different from the mindsets of those who are in power and also from a number of people who are even in the opposition. Wow, that's uh, Major General Magisha Muntu. Uh, the few comments coming through, uh, especially in regard to that whole discussion, on uh, uh, the discussion on um, Serere by election. But maybe I will be able to read them through in the second hour. Uh, uh, let's look at uh, ANT and uh, JEMA. They're the two parties I know that have strongly emphasized the issue, the element of morality in our country, in leadership. You know, sometimes people confuse integrity and morality, much as they move hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Other people focus much on integrity and, they, you know, but the two elements, yes. they have to move hand in hand. And uh, in a country where we have leaders in top positions, uh, running out with uh, iron sheets, <laughs> things meant for the vulnerable communities. Mm. And one would ask if they can steal iron sheets. <laughs> how about money? You know, how about these other things we are not able to see? Yeah. I, I do not know what is really your take on this uh, and what do we need to do as a country 
Of course, you're going to tell me we need to change government. <laughs> then, yeah, of course, it's the toughest challenge. The, the current regime can't change that because it's the foundation on the base of which they survive, corruption. More so the, the, you know, the president. I think he recognizes the fact that if people don't question whatever they do, that's their business. As long as they pay him allegiance, that's then, all. then he thinks he's the solution to whatever problems there are in the country. That is his mindset. But it's causing a lot of problems. And I suspect that he's going to reach a point where he also is trapped, which basically he is. He's like riding on a tiger's back. He don't know how to get off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because the system is totally, it's, it's, it's in a log jam. The people he's dependent on are the ones who are corrupt. If he thinks he's the only solution, he th believes he must stay up there. And therefore, if he believes by, by the knocking them off, he'll get off in his own mind. He'll think that therefore the solution for the problems of the country end. So therefore, he'll think he must hang on. And if, for him to hang on, he must not rock the boat below him. But the pillars are getting more and more rotten. So inevitably, at some point, there's going to be an implosion. <laughs> <laughs> Does this indicate uh, a disconnect in government? Because when you hear the Minister of Finance saying, I just saw the iron sheets in my, in my compound. <laughs> I thought maybe it's uh, a donation f like from it's the office of the Prime Minister. But uh, as, as the, the, the chief finance officer of this country yes. would think before even making such a statement, <laughs> did he ever receive an, or come across a requisition that we need you know, funds to procure iron sheets and donate to members of parliament? You know, one would ask, that does it really indicate that there is a very, very strong disconnect within the different government institutions. It's a natural process of degeneration of all autocratic regimes. I mean, scan the environment everywhere. Look at what used to happen in uh, Iraq, is what happened in Egypt under Mubarak, um, uh, uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Look at what used to happen in Libya, is what happened, what used to happen under Bashir in uh, Sudan. Sudan, is what happened in uh, Mugabe in uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, Kampawere in, uh, in uh, Burkina the, the Faso. Faso yes. Same Omobutu when he was in uh, Congo, DRC, or Bokasa. It's the same trend. It's a human thing. You know? So if eventually it gives way, though. <laughs> it always gives way. That's why, to me, I'm not surprised about what is happening. <laughs> what surprises me is the people who are surprised about what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it really beats uh, common, the understanding of a normal human being. For a minister, a member of parliament, you know, you receive... Because, you see, the moment a, a system ceases to care about accountability, because that's the root cause, N nobody is, accounts the other. Right now, None of them can literally talk about anybody else doing wrong or stealing. Because all of them have got their hands in the till. One is stealing money for water, another one is stealing money for roads, another one is stealing money for electricity, another one is stealing money for, for agriculture, another one is stealing money for different forms of infrastructure. So the one who is stealing for water cannot raise their voice because the one of, or about the one of power, because the one of power says, but what about this one? Like that. They're all victims. So they are they're all, all just they are all trapped. Basically. And, and our society has also degenerated to that level. Because that's happening. It's not only happening in central government. Look at what's happening in the districts. Ask anywhere. There must be very few districts where any young man or woman who gets a job there will get it without paying a bribe right now. Or like you go in a police station and have your statement made and your case is uh, 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 processed and taken the DPP and the DPP prosecutes it properly and the, case, and the case is judged in court without paying bribes. Out of 10 cases, I'd be surprised if you can get three that will go through that whole process before someone pays a bribe. So that's how deep the rot is. So the problem we are facing is not even the regime exit. Because the regime will exit. It's 
a natural process. It will end. You can see anybody who is uh, intelligent enough, not intelligence doesn't require intelligence, who is uh, analytical, or who is able to perceive how things change in environments of this nature, you can see that this regime will, will, will exit at some point. The question is, even when it exits, if the culture remains, because it's already entrenched, like corruption and, and the culture of lack of accountability and the, uh, a culture of lack of you know, transparency, a culture of lack of justice, where if you don't know anybody in a powerful position, you literally almost can't uh, access justice. It's very, very difficult. So how does that change? How does that change? And you almost get a feeling that people are not even think about that. <laughs> I think some of the things that, you know, once this happens, you know, I, I've seen all these countries that have changed leaders and literally they keep moving in the same direction. Why we can't learn and say, you know, how do we act different? Like that, that's our role as leaders. You have to keep talking about these things over and over, over and over until it sinks in the public consciousness. And then people can say, okay, let's see how to break out of this vicious cycle. Because in as far as I'm concerned, Many people are, are focusing on the, the, the weaknesses of this regime, the weaknesses of Genome 70 in the lack of drugs in hospitals, in the lack of jobs for youth, in, in the poor roads in some places, power tariffs and things like that, which are important. A weakness in health and, and, uh, and education. education, yes. And even we as a, as a party, we vote of policy in regard to that. But in my own estimation, the biggest challenge is the moral collapse. That's going to be the toughest challenge. It's fixing infrastructure. You just need it's technical easy. men and women who have integrity and leaders of politics who have integrity. And within one year, you have built environment in a, in, a, in, a, in a ministry to act and act in a transparent way. Because everybody, once they know there is a line, you cross that, you are taken out. People are streamlined and they work. That's easy. But... <laughs> Working on, you know, lifting people's hopes and confidence in themselves, even to know that you can crack down on corruption and it works, is tough. Changing mindsets takes, a, you know, yes. skill and resilience and a lot of coordinated, persistent, focused actions. Now that can't happen unless there are people who are preparing for it. I think that's where the biggest challenge is going to be. Even for those who take over, whoever, whichever group takes over. <laughs> that challenge must be faced. Oh, yeah. If they are not ready, they will just become like those who are in now. Well, thank you so much, General Mugisha Muntu. And uh, it's the hotline show. There's so many comments. And uh, in the second hour, we'll be uh, reading them through. And of course, Jen will be able to respond to some of them. We need to break off very, very briefly. And then uh, we we'll return on, uh, with the, the hotline show. But one key issue here I've picked is that uh, many groups can wish to you know, change, cause regime change. But fixing morality will be an it's another challenge for all Ugandans to make sure that we get back to the moral roots of our country that we are left behind by our four grand grand parents. Well, let's break off very, very briefly. And uh, when we return, the Hotline Show will continue. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Fellow citizens, following the sequence of events, Uganda seems to be at political crossroads. I'm not a servant of anybody. <laughs> Madam, I know the law. <laughs> As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, 
youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation, as he confirms. I will be always here Saturday from 10 a.m. in the morning. Be there. Don't miss the live discussion on the Alternative Uganda, Digitalk TV Facebook pages, and the Alternative Uganda YouTube channel. Are you craving for that special meal that will entice your taste buds and leave you with lasting thrilling memories? Look no further. Spice Island Bulenga has got your answer. Nature fresh and delicious juice, the best meals. Don't miss our daily specials from Monday to Sunday. This is Wednesday. Saturday Pizza Bonanza, you buy one and take two. Come dine with us and feel the experience. We are located at Prime Shopping Center in Bulenga, Mitiana Road. For inquiries, call us on 07-04-11-1720. Spice Island, we treat your cravings. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, welcome back from that short uh, break. The Hotline Show continues. We discussed about uh, the, the integrity, the morality of our leaders. We also looked at uh, the Serere by elections and what happened there. Uh, of course, there were so, so many issues that uh, need to, to be handled. I happened to look through one of uh, the reports uh, that was compiled by uh, one of the uh, observers' team, and it had some good recommendations that's from uh, the national consultative forum and uh, it will be presented to the electoral commission for review and maybe see if there is something they can pick and improve on uh, the future elections within uh, the country now one other thing right now it's the issue of homosexuality homosexuality is everywhere parents are scared when they take their children to school they do not know what happens there uh, the, the, there is this, um, uh, how do you, the scholarship basari thing, you know, it's one way, one avenue that has been widely used. I am not saying you should not take up those offers in case they're there, but you have just have to be very, very careful. Many uh, people have hidden themselves within that, those scholarships, basaris being offered to students, and then in the end, the moment they have uh, their the children in their control, they are able to pass on the information in regards to homosexuality and so many things. And for the Christians, the Bible clearly talks about and condemns homosexuality. Uh, the Quran talks about homosexuality and it's something which is highly, highly, highly condemned. And even in uh, some of our laws, though they... They have some issues. Well, I want to start with I want to start with this general in this second hour of the show. The homosexuality has become an issue. We've we've seen uh, some uh, I just, uh, a video clip from one of uh, the city pastors trying to say that uh, those condemning homosexuality, then you should if you don't want them to get money from that community, then go and support their churches. <laughs> you know, go and support their churches. And th there's so many issues. Now, I want to assume that ANT is in power today and we are in a situation where homosexuality is at its peak like it is right now. How would this be handled? Well, I am only going to speak my own opinions. So let nobody attach whatever I say to... <laughs> To ANT. To ANT position. Yes. <clears throat> Homosexuality is as old as history. Like those who read the Bible, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, 
you know, homosexuality is at the center of, uh, of that story. I don't know about other communities, but I know in a number of our local communities, there's a local word for homosexuality. Like in Unyankore, there is a local word for homosexuality. I know in Uganda, there is a local word for homosexuality. A number of uh, languages in the West, there is a local word for homosexuality. I would like to believe that even in other traditional cultures, there would be a word for homosexuality, which means that it has always existed. existed yes. yes. However, when you look at the global situation here in Africa, mostly in Africa, homosexuality has never been a central issue. It's been there, but peripheral. What surprises me is that now taking center stage, and I suspect that that is as an outcome of a number of Western countries in which it is a central issue. Because there are a number of Western countries where homosexuality is a, an electoral campaign issue. Leaders can lose elections at the presidency or at the level of uh, House of Representatives or congressmen like in America, based on your stand on homosexuality. Because it is central, it is open, it is, uh, it, their society has reached a point where it is uh, an open question. The problem I notice though <coughs> is that we have different issues which are central to our existence as a, as a people. We've just been talking about Serere, where people are not able to make rational choices because they are simply looking for how to eat the next meal. Where they don't have water for animals and their own families for use. Where they would lose a person close to them because there are no drugs in hospitals. Now, ordinarily in our environment, those will be the core issues for determining what kind of governance there would be. But what surprises me is that an issue like homosexuality, which is peripheral, really, in our current environment, would almost take center stage. I simply can't understand it. The only explanation I can have is that there must be some external influence to make it a central issue when ordinarily it would be a marginal issue. But it's a very serious issue, Jim. Now it is here in, the, in our center, but I suspect promoted. So we'll have to discuss it. I don't, it looks like we have no time to other than discuss it. <laughs> but I don't think it's an issue that you are going to find in a rural area, in all these 70,000 villages. I doubt whether they would be discussing that issue around the firelight. The fireplace. <laughs> they are discussing how to survive. They are discussing how to pay school fees for their children. They are discussing how they can eat the next meal. They are discussing how they can get a sick person who is in hospital, who lacks drugs. Or Does care. this discussion sound immaterial to, to talk? You know, the, the discussion on homosexuality, does it sound immaterial? It is not immaterial because for it to gain the level at which it has gained, there must be promotion. So you must recognize that factor, therefore you cannot dismiss it. So one needs to understand why would anybody have to make it a central issue in an area where now it wouldn't be a central issue. So if it's an external interest, one would need to know why would anybody who is interested in homosexuality, because it's a central issue in Europe or in America, want to plant it in, in Uganda, for example, or in Kenya, or Congo, or wherever. Why about trying to, you don't survive. You don't even find that they have really been, uh, most of these African countries really haven't even been clamping down on homosexuals necessarily. Really. But because there is a, a, a global interest that is pushing it, it is now elevating to a level where it can even start causing you know, unnecessary contention and possibly divert attention from the uh, uh, issues which are an ex of an existential threat to our people. It equally poses a threat to our generation. You know, but, but you see, it is not central in, a, in our environment, other than the effort to promote it. And, and I think that's where there has to be a stand. And, and my stand on that would be 
anybody who's trying to promote it within the school systems need to be clamped down on. Adults is a different matter. For issues of adults, I would think that the policy we would take is, like the American Army used to have a policy called don't ask, don't tell policy. Until the Obama regime came and changed that. But I think it would be the most suitable in our environment. At the level of adults, don't ask, don't tell. The issues of, uh, of uh, uh, sexuality uh, uh, between adults would just be left to the adults. They're the ones who know who is straight, who is uh, you know, queer or whatever. But when it comes to promotion, in the young, it has to be stamped out. You cannot allow anybody who now comes and tries to influence a society which has got other issues that it is dealing with on an issue which is peripheral in itself and for their own interest, they are promoting it. That one I don't think, I, I hope that uh, uh, those who are in, uh, in, uh, in uh, positions of uh, developing policy need to see how to stamp it out of schools. There should be no compromise when it comes to that, when it comes to this you, you, you seem to sound yes. like you have no problem with homosexuality as long as it's not within schools. Is, am, I, am I getting it right? Homosexuality is like, uh, I, first, I am a believer. And I know the impact and effect of sin. But homosexuality is not the only sin. There are many sins, right? Prostitution is a sin. There are prostitutes all over the place. Right? Now, homosexuality, as long as someone is not imposing it on the other, you're not going to go checking out people in, in their bedrooms and wherever to know whether they are straight, whether they are queer, whatever they are. Unless now they start promoting it, then they, are, they will be crossing a line. And then two men going to charge for marriage for fish. That should be, be that one. There should be no law accepting that. In as far as I'm concerned, that's a personal view. I mean, again, it's a question of uh, I mean, there are things which we know as normal. There are things we know as abnormal. <laughs> and when we are even uh, evolving laws, <laughs> Laws are based on a number of factors, and one of the factors is what we see as normal. Because if, 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 if you stray beyond that, like some people say, this is a feeling, it's a natural feeling. I mean, there are so many natural feelings that have to be curtailed by individuals. It's like even pedophiles, men who rape young children, pedophiles, it's a feeling. But it's abnormal. So if you say that you are going to, because there are people who talk about rights and, and, and issues of feelings and all that, it's a very slippery area. That is my position. That's the way I look at it. That you don't go out of the way to hunt them down. Don't ask, don't tell. But the moment they try to impose what they're doing, the, the rest of society at this point in time sees as abnormal, they need to walk into a war. Would you share with us the ANT position on this? At this I, I, I know I'm not going to talk about that because we've never discussed it at policy level. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, it's the hotline show, and uh, I, I think I need to read through some comments. There's so many, but uh, I'll try to read a few. And I want to thank all of those who are watching from wherever you are. Ethan Mwine, we thank you. Fortnite Ampira, thank you. Uh, Namuguzi Ntale, thank you. Um, Evans Muyofu, thank you. Kakwenza Rukirabasaija, thank you for watching. Nache Yune, Rita, thank you. Namirembe Angela, thank you. Uh, well, let me read through some comments now. Jeremiah Muchibi, thank you also for watching. Um, watching the good general live from Ankara. 
good to have you sir that's from ethan mwine uh this one's uh, okay let me read this one uh general you are a political agent and we would expect that you can pick into the irregularities of the system what measures do you have or in bracket or at least a planning to influence the spillovers of political dictatorship i don't know if you got that question i didn't pick it clearly uh sorry uh, let me let me read it again uh he says um hey hey i think the team in control room kind of helped me my my phone has just jammed a little bit i can't get back to the quite a number of many comments so i can't get back to the comment i was reading mm -hmm. then this one national reader says if so you are Someone help me share those comments with me so that I am able to read through all of them. Uh, well, I thank all of you who are watching and uh, comments are coming through. I'll be reading them just in the next few minutes. And uh, let's talk about uh, the policy that requires leaders to declare their wealth. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe this is one of the ways when it comes to combating corruption, purported means maybe <laughs> to combat yes. corruption. Because uh, as you discuss, as, as people are declaring their wealth, someone is running away with iron sheets. <laughs> as you're still talking about iron sheets, some goats are missing. As they, you know, so, so many things one after the other, uh, okay. to the point that you even fail on what to talk about. Now, do you think the declaration of wealth, th this policy, one time I remember, it was Honorable Kennedy Charms. Yes. He had issues with this, and I had to miss. Uh, being, <laughs> yeah. I, was it the seventh parliament, seventh uh, around that time? Then uh, the daughter had to come in, and you know, yeah. b because of <clears throat> the declaration of wealth. Now, is this something which is uh, commendable and can do something to track down those who accumulate wealth in, in a, a normal functioning in, system, in a system where there is a culture of transparency? It's a good policy because it is a starting point to be able to track the wealth of a leader over a period of time so that uh, if you find, if it's found that you have got wealth which you can't explain, then they have got a basis on which they will raise <coughs> questions. Now, the current situation, though, is complicated. Because you ask yourself, OK, at a technical level, it is important to, you know, to declare. But what effect? <laughs> because we need to work. It just be a database of information, but I'm not so sure that it's going to be helpful at all. Because if you have a situation where those who are in power cannot be questioned, then it doesn't help at all. So it's there. It's on the, it's on the, uh, the laws are there on the statute books. Maybe we need to fulfill them. That's all right. But I don't think they can be used effectively to rectify the situation. Because I mean, <laughs> if you cannot deal with the cases which are in the open, I mean, look like the issues of the hunches. <laughs> so many so people declare, well, what, how will it help? You know. So it's uh, an issue just for discussion and debate, but it's time hasn't come yet. Until we get a regime which is, you know, uh, disciplined to ensure that right from the president down, all of them do it and that they cannot be questioned. When that happens, they need to work. It creates discipline in everybody who is in a position of leadership. And it also helps the investigators <coughs> because they have a starting point. And when the investigators know that they can walk in the office of anybody and carry out an investigation. And we have seen it happen. I mean, it is not something difficult. We have seen countries where everybody, including the top leadership, are questioned. How many times have we had countries even where sitting presidents have been questioned? 
Actually, we, even we have in, seen South what in South Korea, we have seen what's happening in, yes. in, in South Africa. Yes. Exactly. So in a system like that, then you know that it is important. It is it needs to be done, and also it needs to be enforced so that everybody does what it makes declaration. But when you declare and it is simply that for record sense. purposes, <laughs> <laughs> so how does it help? Do you spot <laughs> any sort of uh, willingness for this regime? to fight corruption? Uh, they don't have the capacity, even if they had uh, the desire, they don't have the will. It takes courage. They don't have the courage. They don't have the moral courage. Period. <laughs> so these units that have been established, we have the, uh, the IGG, of course, we have the State House and Corruption Unit, something. And uh, just psychological. Creating people, jobs for people? No, not just creating jobs. Create a psychological state of that you're doing something. belief that something is being done and therefore people can be hopeful. Nothing. I see, for example, I normally, I, at times, I've made a few tweets around this, where I hear the presidential something, something against corruption. Just <laughs> when you reach a point where the president has to have a unit to fight against corruption, and it is active investigating cases, then you know that the whole system has collapsed. And at one point, the state... Did Why? The because by the time the president sets up an investigative agency against corruption in the office of the presidency, it means that the IGG has totally failed. It means that the uh, criminal investigation department has completely failed. Because if they were effective, then there would be no need of such a response. But you find that there's such a response means that the other two have collapsed. Why have they collapsed? Because you have not paid attention to them. That also shows you the management style of leaders. Instead of substituting where there's weakness and you put there something new, instead of now putting resources, human, technical, logistical, and financial, to build the capacity of that unit so that it becomes effective in what it is supposed to do, you now want to substitute it. How do you substitute it? You put up an office. How would an office that is centered here in Kampala, maybe with 20 people, how would it carry out investigations on a countrywide basis? It's just a, a mess. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> they need to put money behind criminal investigation department rebuild it, uh, 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 train the best that the country can offer, young men and women, train them effectively, equip them effectively, motivate them, give them logistical, adequate logistical backup, give the leaders confidence and you tell them within a year, once he results in one, two, three, and let, let them loose. And they should know that there's no office in which they cannot enter. And then you see what will happen. And you can do that simultaneously, <coughs> maybe with IGG. Maybe at times you can say, okay, CID concentrate on, 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 on uh, certain levels of cases. And if you want to crack down corruption more so in a, an environment like we are in, like IGG, to deal with cases above a certain level and to have the confidence and then when the two are operating, they can coordinate effort. But it's critical that they are well trained, that they are well motivated, that they are well facilitated. Uh, facilitated. And critical to know that there is no office in which they cannot enter. And then I can, I can tell you, you'll see how these criminals will start looking for places to hide and they won't get those places. It's just a joke. So with the current establishment, there is nothing, nothing that can come out. This is my estimation. Let, let, let them prove. Let, let them prove us wrong. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> General. I, I need to go back to the comments. There are so, so many here. And let me try to read through those that I'll be able to read. And of course, General will be able to respond. Uh, Elas Jason, thank you. Uh, in a real sense and the truth of the matter. Among Uganda's top politicians who are sober to steer this country forward is retired Major General Mugisha Gregory Muntu and retired Colonel Dr. Chiza Besije. But the problem is that 
our masses leave serious people and go for unserious people because of popularity but with zero ideas and understanding of this country. That is Elas Jason. Thank you. Frank Nwasasra is watching from Doha. Thank you for watching. To Gume Fidel, I agree with you, General. Change can delay, but it can always come to pass. ANT, the best option. Thank you. This is uh, Sula Magez. My OB is your OB. My OB Muntuyela High School. My next president. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is Joseph Gaga to see General Gay is at climax in the world than ever before. Because we are near to the end of times. He said he must be a believer. Trump hit hard gays. <clears throat> and now in Europe and US, being a gay supporter, you lose elections. Satanists are the gays. Uh, there were more there was more to that comment, but the, the team that shut them didn't uh, bring it out. Then uh, Tugume Fidel comes back. We are in the end times. The evil things that used to be hidden are now in the open. But those who will stand to the end will wear the crown. Shun the devil and homosexuality. Then this one says Leviticus 18th. Is it chapter 18, verse 22? You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Namu Guzin Tali Jude says, Thank you, Norman. I can't get enough of General Muntu. Thank you. Ethan Mwine, General, you are a political agent, and we would expect that you can... I think I read this. Then um, Namirembe Angela, former national coordinator ANT, who is the current? Okay. Oh, uh, okay. <clears throat> the, the current is the Honorable Alice Alasso. Alice Alasso, Honorable Alice Alasso is the current national coordinator. And then one time we were here, he told us if you were uh, uh, hold, running for a political position uh, at such uh, level, you do not hold any party position. Like when we get uh, a delegates conference, eventually when we build the infrastructure and the chairperson of the party cannot run for any other political office, their purpose is to run the party, build it, organize it, it's robust, it gives supportive uh, infrastructure and all the <coughs> roles necessary for other candidates running in different positions. But the chairperson cannot run for any other position. So currently you have no position in the ND? Now I am just part of the uh, 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 committee, but I, I don't have a leadership position. Why? Because we want to immunize the party. I mean, the, the temptation for leaders to build things around themselves, I mean, it is human. Because mm -hmm. if you are the party leader and you intend to run for office, the, 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 <coughs> the, the, the temptation to build things around yourself is great. And there are not many people who can withstand that temptation. And so that does and not cut across. You can have one good leader today, tomorrow you may have a, a, a one who doesn't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. So to immunize the party, more so the party which wants to build you itself it. long term, you do that. So that does not apply to the national coordinator? No, like now, <coughs> we, want, we wanted to practice that even before we have substantive leadership. Okay. And by 2026, we will have substantive <coughs> leadership. And whoever it is going to be, whoever becomes the chairperson of the party, will come in very well knowing that they cannot run for presidency, they cannot run for anything. You have to give your cannot, all yes, to, the party. to the party. Well, Nacha Inerita is our anniversary follower. Uh, he says, ANT has been bragging about building structures. Are they proud of what happened in Sereri? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the chain yeah. Rita. We were there. We were proud of that. We did all. We, didn't, we don't chicken out of situations, however tough they are. Okay. <laughs> Evans Muyof is our milestone follower. Thank you guys for keeping it at uh, Dig Talk TV. Good evening, Alternative Dig Talk. Well, this one said, Jen, what is the ANT doing about the frustrations of the common people? At least you have made a diagnosis. How are you leveraging the position to impact the aftermath of that frustration? Communication. The only way you change mindsets of people is through communicating, training. Those who you access, you train. And, and, and hope. I mean, hope is something intangible. You can't touch it. But it's a critical factor for any human to exist and function. 
any human being who loses hope starts dying. That's why you find a patient. You can treat a patient, but if they have no hope of, of, of recovery, they will die. <laughs> you know? Then this one says, if so, if so, I think it was a, con a, a continuation from somewhere. He says, if so, your irrecon irreconcilable differences are still in existence. Oui. I suggest that you either join FDC back and build on their structures, sell, or join NUP since they have mobilization abilities but lack organization. You can work well for them as a good organizer. You see, there is confusion over the question of irreconcilable differences between us and, uh, and uh, the FDC. FDC. The irreconcilable differences between us and, uh, and us and FDC was when we were within FDC. Because our strategies were different. They believed in civil disobedience as the primary, uh, the core strategy for building the party. We, we, we believe that while it is important, that it should not be the primary, that we should concentrate on building the party infrastructure and uh, building its organizational capability and taking the grassroots uh, uh, leadership so it becomes the springboard on which we would take the presidency through the electoral processes. That's where the irreconcilability came in. What would be the primary thrust? The contention could not be uh, we will not be able to work with them simultaneously. So we reached a point when the delegates chose that uh, defiance should be the primary <coughs> strategy. Actually, not the, not the primary strategy. The core strategy. The, the core strategy and the only. Because the, the 20, 2017 resolved the contention. Because uh, one of the candidates, Honorable uh, Patrick Oboy Amoria, in his campaign said, we need to resolve this matter once and for all. We cannot have two strategies competing. Decide. The one you decide upon will be the only strategy. And the delegates chose. They chose defiance. We never contested that. We you agreed. also went for? We went and handed over, peacefully. But we recognized that we needed to build around our strategy as the primary core strategy. So we decided to separate peacefully. And therefore the they concentrated the, 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 the Yes, yes, the yes, yes. And our message has always been, please, we don't want to stand in your way. You use defense. If you're able to take power, we have no problem. Because it means we have resolved the problem of what has impeded us going into power. But on policy positions and things like that, we, we, wouldn't have no we wouldn't have any problem. We would be able to say, what do we do here? What do we do there? So the moment we separated, in as far as I'm concerned, the issue of reconciliable differences ended. When they have a clear path, we have a clear path. <laughs> so why on earth would uh, we have but, any but problem general, with that? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever had a time to yes. sit and evaluate your strategy, whether it's really yielding out for you. To me, it is. Or you're just being confident because that's what you believe in? No. <laughs> you know, let me, let me tell you. Uh, actions based on a theoretical understanding of a situation and the analysis you make of it, the success of your actions are going to be dependent on the analysis you have made and the... Uh, conclusions you reach and therefore you set out, knowing that this is where we want to go, this is how we want to go there. And you can give yourself time scales, you can keep on adjusting. As long as you believe that the direction you are taking is the correct direction, whether there are people who believe you or not, keep at it. Unless you are convinced that actually it's the wrong direction, then you can start trying to cut out corrective actions in terms of direction. We believe we're in the right direction. And it doesn't matter whether there are only 10 people with us or not. It doesn't. If it's a million or 10, we believe we're in the correct path. And therefore, we are satisfied in believing in that and doing that. While we still have dissatisfaction, of course, and we understand the reasons why, is the impediments that we have not yet cut through. 
you know, like raising the hope of people who believe in what we are doing, but who don't have the courage yet to join. That always happens also. So we have to keep at it until that happens. I mean, I've seen history, in history, I mean, all, all successful people, whether it's in business, whether it's in military endeavors, whether it's in exploration, wherever, have, have, have <coughs> one, something they believe to be right. And it, it has to be right. Because if it's not right, it doesn't matter whether you believe. Belief at all, belief alone cannot advance you unless what you believe in is correct. If what you believe in is correct and you have the resilience and the, st the staying power and the focus and the effort, you keep applying effort, I can tell you, as day follows night, you reach those objectives. There is a I mean, quote. history is littered with that. It's not only in politics. It's, 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 it's in business. It's, it's, it's in military campaigns. It is in uh, those who do uh, uh, all kinds of things, you know? Even in sports. Why can't people decipher that? <laughs> there, there is a comment that has amused me here yes. on that same point. Yes. Someone is saying here that... Uh, that's the, that strategy is not working for general, but it's just Quakers. <laughs> no, and who, whoever it is, let them keep their, that message, right? I don't know him, he knows himself. When it works, let him look back and find out why was he not able to see what I see. Let me tell you, like when I went to the bush in the 80, I shook the hands, I, was, I remember clearly Livingstone Hall in the quadrangle, two students, one engineering, another education, who are UPC. And we shook hands on it. I told them we are going to eliminate this regime. We don't use to contend about the things which are going wrong and things, uh, fortunately all of us were new, you know, backgrounds of UPC. I could analyze the situation and, and see the end of the regime. I didn't have any military background. Then I was a student. I could see, as you can clearly see, during daytime, where we were heading and what would happen, literally. Because you could see the dynamics, the political dynamics. You could read the situation in the population. And we shook hands. We went. Five years after that, what I literally had told them came to pass. Unfortunately, I never met them. One was in South Africa, another one I never bumped into him thereafter. But wherever they are, I hope they look back. So I don't know whose name that is. Let him look back, because that time <laughs> is going to come. Let's pray I'm alive and he's alive, or she's alive. I don't know whether it's a man or a woman. Uh, this is Patrick Bihujayo. Be yes. Bihujayo. Keep that message, Bihujayo. I he's don't know. No. It's a different one, not the other one. The well, other one. <laughs> whoever it is, whoever that one is, tell him to keep that message somewhere in the future. I hope he remember to look back and say, why was I not able to see this? <laughs> Maybe it can help him in whatever <laughs> other endeavor he's in. Okay, Bihujaho <laughs> is watching us from uh, South Africa. He says, uh, watching our freedom fighter from Johannesburg. No turning back. That's Patrick Bihujaho. Uh, okay, sorry, I mixed up. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Then uh, Nyakato Rusoke, General Muntu, thank you for the show. <laughs> As usual, you are on point. Asante, Afande. <laughs> Gerard Rimaso, if he is given the authority, what would be his view towards homo as well as Western influence in our society? I think this comment came through before no, we talked about Western it. Western influence is always <coughs> going to be there. That's one thing we need to recognize. Anybody who, is, who intends to take over leadership, you must know. Right now, even as we speak, incidentally, there is a realignment of forces on a global scale. And we happen to be a focal point, not just Uganda, the whole of Africa. Why? Because we are sitting on resources, mineral resources, uh, as a source of uh, food, raw material, you know what I mean? We have a huge population, huge populations growing. It's estimated that in the next 30 years, Africa is going to have 2.3 billion people. Now you can imagine if the economies of Africa are working and then you have got a market of 2.3 billion people. Who on earth will not be focusing on a, on a continent <laughs> like that? So the question is, what do we ourselves do? There are things that we believe in that we need to do. 
Three, we must recognize that we want not an island, that there are other people outside who will want to exert influence on us. Best, scenario, best, set, best case scenario for them is if they can control you. <laughs> yes. Best case scenario for you is if you build robust systems that can enable you to operate and function in terms of partnership and trade on a global scale without anybody taking advantage of you. It's up to us. If we are equal to the task, we'll be able to do that and be able to benefit from the God-given resources that we do have. If we remain the way we are now, focusing on the dairy food, we can easily be recolonized. <laughs> <laughs> well, another, to Gume again, uh, to Gume Fidel says, um, the question was, what would General Muntu do to combat the spill over of dictatorship in Uganda? I think we... Did you respond to this? No. Uh, we, that's the one you are asking for to be reminded. Okay. I mean, we already have an authoritarian regime. What we are trying to do is to oust it, but also build the necessary <coughs> infrastructure in terms of governance systems, also in the terms of culture of the people. For people who are bored, because the majority of our people now are seeking simply to survive. Whenever someone gets an opportunity on a job or has got a small business, their main focus is how do I survive? How do I protect myself? It doesn't matter what happens to anybody else. <laughs> so and what happens tomorrow? What happens tomorrow? <laughs> so if we don't change that culture, it is very difficult to withstand dictatorship. Anybody can become a dictatorship in that kind of environment. <laughs> Well, I have uh, Butera Raymond. Homosexuality has a hidden proxy war <clears throat> that has been transferred to African by religious organizations that failed against human rights defenders in developed countries. Both parties of pro and ant, ant the against, yes. <clears throat> are heavily funded and they should stop their monologue of promotion but when actually it is a failed war in developed countries that has found a soft fertile land riding on our cultural beliefs it is nice to see my president general mugisha muntu enlightening enlightening the country thank you welcome thank you uh this one again general muntu as the by-elections were in high gear we saw fdc Failed to join you, as Noop did, citing irreconcilable differences, and stated that they were fronting their own candidates. What are those irreconcilable differences, and should we be hopeful about any form of bondage between the two political parties? That is, if decent, I think you responded to this. Uh, yeah, where we are now, we have no irreconcilable differences. With the You're FDC. totally different. I mean, we are now different entities. Yes. If DC believes in defiance, and we wish them luck in uh, uh, advancing on that front. We and believe in what, in we are, we are, what we are doing. But wherever there is an opportunity for us to coordinate effort, we have no problem with that at all. <laughs> you know? Wait, then this one uh, says, uh, General, you, in bracket ANT, have always been in the Serere and West Nile subregions way before the by-election. Before even the former MP died, how would you credit your earlier efforts given the outcomes of the by-election. In bracket, most of all by a senior political leader, Alasso. It is true there was rigging, but you can't possibly conclude that over 12,000 votes were rigged in favor of the victor. Yeah, we have got uh, some cases in by-elections where they have even declared like the fourth person. But this they year they didn't declare the fourth. Where they, 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 they completely disregard <clears throat> the outcomes. I mean, even, you know, there are so many influences, but... Anyway, to be honest with you, I, I appreciate the people having different perspectives on a situation. There are people who have their own perspectives about Syria. We have our own perspectives about Syria. We have our own perspectives of, about where we are. We intend to keep doing the things that we intend to do. We don't expect that everybody is going to believe in what we, you know, we, what we are doing, and we do have no problem with that. The only thing we are sure of is that as long as we keep doing the things which we believe are the correct things to be done, and we do them, there is a time when we are going to become the solution, even for the people who are skeptical. Well, this is a retired, I don't know the retired in what capacity, I don't know, retired Eben Saul 
the second. He says, Uganda's problems are Ugandans themselves because they don't know serious leaders. M.M. Mugisha Muntu is the best to lead this country. That is re retired Ebenu Saulo II. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then this is uh, Elizabeth Ndagiri Mumbeja. I know you may not read. <laughs> I know you may not read my comment. We have read it and we are reading it. I know you may not read my comment, but unless General Mugisha Muntu builds connection with youth, who are the largest part of our population, his valuable leadership skills will remain with him. This is Elizabeth Ndagire Mumbeja. Yeah, we reach out to youth. We have got a vibrant youth infrastructure. We are not uh, focusing on the numbers yet. We are focusing on the quality of the leaders. Because to us, it's very, very important. It's, not, it's never the numbers. Because really, if it was numbers, then NRM should be, you know, they, they would have built this country to, to heights. I mean, it would just be in the sky. They would not even be campaigning. <laughs> Absolutely. They would just nominate and what they have that. done why, for why, are <laughs> why are they terrified? Why are they terrified? They have the numbers. <laughs> we are looking for quality. Why? Because we need qualitative change. So we keep reaching out to young people who are resilient around what they believe in, who are focused, who are disciplined. People who change nations are never many. <laughs> That's another thing which most people don't understand. You can have millions of people backing you, but you just completely fail. Yeah. Genome 70, when we came in here, literally like in the western, in the, in the central, because at that time the north was not yet on board, northeast was not yet on board, would have crowds of people. <laughs> but where are we now? You focus on building a qualitative, infrastructure, you know, organizational infrastructure, staffed by young, you know, men and women of integrity, if you want to build systems that are going to deliver services, where you expect to have, uh, you know, equal opportunities, where you expect to have justice, where you expect to have transparency, where you expect to have uh, equality before the law. You recruit people who believe in that, because it is one thing to, the Americans say, talk is cheap. Any of us can say anything. I mean, we've been saying all these things, uh, like I'm saying now, since 1960. So why are we not where we wanted to be? And we seem, actually, we seem, <laughs> I think there is a crisis in this country. There is a crisis. I mean, <laughs> the people who, are crying out to have transparency, they are trying, <laughs> crying out for justice, they are crying out for democracy. They are not seeking to build the people who believe in those values. values. Who, who, who is going to give you what they don't have? I like that. How can you build democracy without democrats? How can you build a transparent culture, a, no, a culture of transparency, unless you have got leaders who believe in who transparency. deeply believe in it, who just don't talk about it. So do you, do you we, we, we don't have, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, because these days we are so immersed in uh, uh, quick fix things. You know, fast foods, fast this, fast that, fast that, everything is fast. You can't create human beings who are like that, just like that. It's a process. It's a process. There are already those who are there, who already have the convictions, you have to attract them. They have to be convinced that it is even possible. In Uganda, there are many. But many have given up hope. They don't think, they don't think that <laughs> this can work. <laughs> Two, you've got to get people who have the inclination, but are not yet built. You have to work with those until you build a critical number. This country doesn't need a thousand people to transform a country. Not a thousand, not more than a thousand. Well, uh, hmm, still continuing with uh, some comments here. This is Ezekiel Ruhinda. General Muntu is intelligent, composed with vision, with a vision to lead Uganda. One day we shall overcome. That's Ezekiel. Ezech I don't know the, how they pronounce it. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel Ruhinda. <clears throat> Thank you. Then uh, there is um, Gerald. Irmaso, Irmaso. Me, I would like to meet him. 
I think you. He is one of inspiring people I have. I have people who hit me deeply when I come out to speak truth in my area. So <clears throat> I need guidance from such people like him. This is Gerard Irmaso. If you can, I don't know whether you have a number, you can send his number and then we will get in touch with him. Yes, uh, Gerard Irmaso, kindly just uh, go to our inbox and uh, share your contact. We will give it to General, he will contact you. Uh, I think that's the easiest way. Alternati alternatively, you could uh, just go to the inbox of our the alternative dig talk, just drop your line there. We'll share it with General and then he will be able to contact you. And please, you'll meet him and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> then Evans Mioff again, kindly ask for us, the general, that has always advocated for strategic planning. Discuss, you to discuss, not me. What percentage level can the general assure the citizens that they have reached at? In terms of? Strategic planning. That's one part of the question. The second question from the same person. If ANT seems to be in the need to lead this country, Uganda, what arms of governance do they think they are more assertive to transform its operations? Uh, repeat the last one, that one. If ANT seems to be in need to lead this country, Uganda, what arms of governance do they think they are more assertive to transform its operations? It's like cross. where do you see the big gaps? I think from the the three arms of government, where do you think you can? Well. Literally, all of, all of them are in a state of you know, <laughs> paralysis. The judiciary is in dire need of uh, revamping. The parliament is on its knees. <clears throat> the executive is the cause of the two. But the moment you take charge of the executive, it is easier to create the environment in which other two can be able to revive themselves. And even though the executive, the state uh, security apparatus, if you have go taken over charge of the executive, like in the army, there are many officers and men who are well educated, who are well trained. Once you create uh, a conducive environment, they can professionalize the army. They can put it back on track, bring discipline. And it's all not that. Prof professionalized yet. Well, it's of course, there are so many challenges there. There are still challenges. But there are many officers and men who are capable because <coughs> they have got the capabilities to do that. But there has to be a conducive environment. There also has to be a strict supervision. That means that the executive has been the hands of people who know what they are doing, who know that once you create the environment, that the capabilities which are within the police, in the intelligence services, that they'll be able to do the things that need to be done so they can build a firm foundation on the basis of which this state can exist in a state of stability and be able to meet the challenges, regional or international. Well, this is I uh, have Musoke Robert. Ask General, we have heard of ideologies like center-right, center-left, which aim at having a balanced political stand. Apparently, ANT is deemed corporate, stroke, non-confrontational. Wouldn't it be fair for ANT to make it high, a breed party, I think meant a hybrid party, with, let's say, corporate defiant, to cater for both the radicals and the non-confrontation. <laughs> Otherwise, thanks for the show. <laughs> you know, there, 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 I think there, there, are two, there, there are two issues. One, I think one issue is talk about uh, uh, political ideologies in terms of center, center right, yes, center the, left. the political scale. Yes. But then again, I think it's talking about strategy, internal organization mm -hmm. strategy. Internal organization strategy, luckily enough, being a young party and uh, we started at a time when we were able to express ourselves who we are, which direction we want to take. We don't have any contention internally about strategy. Everybody who comes agrees, in, to, agrees what to what we have said we were. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when we were forming FDC, the main issue was regime change. So the contention about the methods of use for change evolved when we were already in there, all of us. And that's why the contention arose. But with NT, right from inception, everybody knows which direction we have chosen to take. And uh, basically, that's what I can say. Then uh, on, 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 on the political, ideological scale, where do you belong? Center left, <laughs> center right, s extreme right, extreme left? 
No, we are a party that believes in uh, one, the, 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 the individual at the core of the development process. So any investment, even to build a society that is stable, that is self-propelling, must be rooted in the investment of the individual in terms of good education, in terms of good health services, in terms of nutrition or food, uh, food security around the individual. So as they build the family, and then the families build a community, and the community builds a nation, a strong nation. I also believe that free enterprise is at the core of a, a stable <coughs> economic development process, but only where government intervenes in areas of a strategic nature where uh, private investment, whether domestic, whether international, cannot venture into. But general, everyone That's say, our focus. General, everyone says that. Yes. You, you know, when you look at uh, that political uh, grid, uh, uh, scale, yes. uh, it makes, it's, it's actually the foundation for the political ideology of uh, any political organization. Yes. And it's that position, yes. positioning where you fall, yes. that makes the kind of allies you should have yes. as your government. Yes. For instance, like you go to the Russians, the Chinese, yes. they're more of, you know, extreme right. No, no, you know, you know, there's a time when there was a contention between communism and, uh, and capitalism. Yes. It was a clear cut. Uh, during the, the pre, the, the Cold War areas, before there was a collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And when Soviet Union collapsed, and then China itself now evolved. Because even within China, it used to be a capitalist-led economy. Until there was internal uh, contentions, Deng Xiaoping was purged, because he was talking about uh, moving on a new path of uh, uh, capitalist development. It was purged. China continued moving on the communist uh, path in terms of economic development until they recognized that what Deng Xiaoping had been telling them was correct. So they rehabilitated him and became the leader and charted the Chinese Communist Party on the new path of capitalist economic development with Chinese characteristics. Since that time, when you look at China, yes, in terms of uh, a number of ways they control power, you can see that uh, uh, the model is communist. But in terms of how the economy functions, really it is functioning on the capitalist model. So right now, I am not so sure that you can say that there is any country which is built on a communist model of economic development. Alone. Alone. It's a hybrid. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Well, so the, 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 the economic <coughs> systems are evolving. The contention now, like Russia, now, look at the war between Russia and the West. It is not even on, on, the, on the principles of economic development. You cannot say that Russia is a communist country at all. <laughs> at all. Generally, I'm running out of time. <laughs> and uh, uh, since someone said I may not read their comment, I want to make sure that I exhaust all of these comments here. Um, okay, let me read it. Nacha Inorita says, during your departure from the FDC, you prophesied that time will tell who the real moles are. As we speak now, Mao is in NRM. What is, what is the take about I was, I was not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you can apply that really to another party. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, then uh, Richard in Nerese, please say hi to General. Mm, I've said it. Then uh, thanks for the show. Uh, Emon Tumusime, thanks General Mugisha Muntu, my president. Keza, Remy, political grounds have changed. General, you need the population. Population always comes. Okay. Always. Well. The question is, by the time it comes, are you organized? Prepared. Are you prepared? Because where are you taking that population, even <laughs> when it comes? Well, this year I have a Kiza. <laughs> no, no. I have Masaba Willy. Uganda's politics is about populism. Otherwise, if we were to go by ideals, values, and mindset, Mugisha Mutu will always be my president. Thank you. That's I think this one was responding to what Masaba would have said. 
that's true general is the best that is our last comment <laughs> other comments that will come in and sorry i will not be able to read them but let's keep the conversation flowing general we are we are come to the end of our show thank i just you. need to have your parting shot and then we get out of here we'd like to thank you for hosting me again thank you to thank the viewers who have been able to attend to this uh, program and to really uh, ask that we all remain hopeful and they will all keep engaging further and further, deeper and deeper in the other activities that will enable us to lead to a stable and hopefully smooth transition and then how to change direction of the country from where it is, a mess as it is, onto the correct path. Thank you so much. Well, I also want to thank all our viewers. And, and um, God bless you all. Amen. I want to thank all our viewers who have been with us from the time we started the show. And now this brings us to tonight's to, to the end of our tonight's edition of the Hotline Show. I want to thank the team I've worked with, uh, my producers, the directors, the control, room, the control room team. Thank you all for putting this together. And of course, our viewers, we thank you for always keeping it Dig Talk TV. We have a lot in stock for you. And uh, just keep your data on. And of course, your phone in your hands, you'll be able to see a lot that's within uh, the pipeline. My name is Abdal Latif, and this brings us to the end of uh, tonight's show. Have a lovely night. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk.